Visual perspective taking is very simply the need to consider what another person can see from a different point of view. So when my children have breakfast, um, like they do every morning, then we have a very busy breakfast table and there's a child sitting here and a child sitting here and there's bowls and a bowl of sugar and a jug of milk and there's a big packet of cornflakes. And depending on how you put the packet of cornflakes, then maybe one person can see the, the um, bowl of sugar but the other but can't see the jug of milk and the other person maybe they can see the jug um, but they can't see the handle of the jug because it's hiding. So visual perspective taking is all about working out what other people can see from different points of view. Um, and it sounds like a very, very simple thing, but it's something that may again be very fundamental to um, our social interaction with other people because if you can track what other people can see, you've then got a very good idea about what other people know. It comes up in the child's game of hide and seek, um, that one child wants to hide and can you hide effectively so that your friends can't find you. Um, but in a more ecological context, um, hide and seek could come up many times in combat, in hunting, in times when people want to deceive each other. And if you can track where other people are and what they can see, then you would be able to deceive them and steal the thing that they've hunted or steal the fruit from their garden. Or if you're in a war or a battle situation, you would be able to attack the other person with a um, great advantage if they don't know that you're coming. Being able to just track what other people can see is a very, very useful skill for many um, different types of social interaction. And um, there's a variety of interesting um, types of research that try to look at this and understand um, what is it that lets us understand, track other people's um, visual, visual access, what they can see. Um, it's also um, very interesting because what somebody can see obviously leads on to what they know, which is called theory of mind. And theory of mind is something that since um, 1978 has been a sort of central theme of social psychology, social neuroscience. Um, that's about understanding that other people may have a different belief to you. Um, so another person could have a false belief. I could um, have, when I left home this morning, um, I think that the jug of milk in my fridge was full, but then now that I'm um, here, my children have come home and they've finished all of the milk. So I believe the jug is um, full, but they believe, um, they know that the jug is empty and I have a false belief. They haven't told me yet that I have to buy some more milk on the way home because otherwise I won't have anything for my breakfast tomorrow. So I might have a um, false belief about the state of something in the world and being able to understand that other people have false beliefs um, seems to be one of these core things that different, may differentiate people from um, non-human primates. And um, we think that um, there's been a lot of philosophizing about how it is that we could have this type of understanding of false belief. Um, so that's kind of something that perspective taking leads on to. Um, but returning just to the core topic of perspective taking, um, there's a variety of different ways to look at perspective taking. And in particular, there's been a very important distinction made between level one perspective taking and level two perspective taking. So level one perspective taking is just what can you see? Can you see this object or not? So if I had a barrier here, then I could see um, the ring on my finger, I could see the thing on the front of the barrier. So it's just, um, is the thing visible or is it hidden? Level two perspective taking is a bit more advanced. That's the question of what does it look like from your point of view? If there was a teapot here on the table, then depending on how I turn the teapot round, either I can see the handle of the teapot, but I can't see the spout, or I turn it so I can see both the handle and the spout, but somebody sitting at the other side of the table would have a different view of that teapot to me. Um, and it turns out that um, that level two perspective taking, understanding what something looks like from a different point of view is um, a much more advanced skill um, than level one. So for example, we've looked at um, children with autism who we know have difficulties with theory of mind, we know that they have difficulties with many kinds of social interaction, 
and um, many studies have shown that these children are quite good at doing level one perspective taking. They can work out what another person can see, but they find it much, much harder to do level two perspective taking and to understand that the same object may look different because different people are sitting on different sides of the table and have a different point of view on that object. Um, so by doing these kind of studies, we can start to separate out exactly which parts of social cognition are easy for children with autism and which parts are difficult. Um, and to also say something about the different kinds of mechanism that underlie these different aspects of perspective taking. So some of the questions that are very important um, in the area of perspective taking at the moment. Um, first is developmentally, at what age can children do this? Um, for a long time, um, up until 10, 15 years ago, it was always believed that these tasks were very, very difficult for any children under four or five years old. So that toddlers, babies, they had no idea about things like visual perspectives and theory of mind. Um, but in the last 10 years, there's been an increasing amount of evidence showing some really remarkably sophisticated abilities um, to make sense of um, perspectives and theory of mind and other people's points of view in really very young babies. Um, but this research remains quite controversial. So um, people are still looking for um, ways to pin this down and say how sophisticated are young infants in their ability to understand what other people know and what other people can see. Where's the sort of transition um, from the kind of understanding that infants have to the kind of understanding that four-year-olds or adults have. Is there a sudden step change in this understanding um, or do infants really have the same type as adults? Um, that's one um, sort of very active area of research. The other um, question that people are very interested in really is to how much do adults do this stuff automatically? Do we have to think about it every time we want to imagine what somebody else can see that requires cognitive effort and will be quite a sort of challenging process if you're not paying attention, you'd get it wrong. Or maybe some people suggest there's mechanisms in our brain that do it just like that without you having to think about it at all. Um, it just gives you the answer. Um, and if there's that kind of automatic mechanism that just gives you the answer without you even knowing it, then that tells us um, quite a lot about sort of how it works in the brain, that it must be a much simpler process um, and a much more robust process, but again, maybe more limited in terms of flexibility if you're having to keep track of two or three people because you're in a game of hide and seek and you're trying to get past somewhere without them seeing you, then that will become a much more challenging operation. So where those boundary lines are between what you can do automatically without thinking about it and what things need you to be really engaged and working um, is a very important question. And are those two things really the same mechanism or are they two different mechanisms um, that you're using in quite different ways? So um, we'd love to use things like neuroimaging to look at this, but it's quite challenging to do some of these studies in a brain scanner, a brain, uh, MRI brain scanner, if you've ever been in one, is a sort of small, dark, noisy tube and you have to lie very still in there and you can't move your head around and you can only press a couple of little buttons. Things like perspective taking really require you to be looking around the real world and thinking about what's going on in the world and who can see what from where. Um, so it's quite hard to do that in a small noisy scanner where you have to stay still. And this is where we're using new technologies like virtual reality um, to try to bring these things into um, neuroimaging. And um, we're also using new neuroimaging methods like functional neuroinfrared spectroscopy that allows us to record brain activity while people walk around and engage in social tasks. Um, and so these new methods and new techniques are going to be something that show us a lot more about what's going on in some of these very fundamental brain processes. So the future of the field of um, perspective taking is um, going to be, as I said, there's the developmental question and there's the question of what's different in adults. Um, there's an, also an increasing amount of work looking at skills like perspective taking in non-human primates and various forms of apes and macaque monkeys to try and pin down um, what they can do and can't do in this area, um, which remains very controversial. And um, I think increasingly we're going to also be using some of these things to think about how we can build artificial systems 
um, either robots or virtual reality characters which are able to take perspectives and how much they need to be able to use that kind of facility in order to have sensible social interactions with people. If your sat nav is able to have some idea of what you can and can't see, then it might be able to give you much better directions um, and stop you getting lost in quite the same way.